in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, welcome, everyone. In our series, What Would Jesus Undo? My role tonight is to talk about our prayer life. I got a feeling there's some things in our lives that we're doing that Jesus would like to just, you know what, let's just get, let's just put that aside and let's do it this way. I bet you all of us are struggling um, with honest prayer. Many of us would admit that we can do a lot better in making time to pray. When, when we do pray, how honest are we with the realities of communicating with the God of the universe? Today we're going to unpack the parable of the Pharisee and a tax collector. This parable doesn't focus on what these two say. I want you to remember this. It doesn't focus on what these two say, but it focuses on what they think. He's going to pull out the very heart of each character in this story. Would Jesus undo in our lives our thought life? Would it undo some of our habits? Would he undo the way that we treat each other? Would he undo some of the things that we do as we gossip? All those things that we need God's help for. My prayer for us tonight is that we will commit to prayer and commit to pray honestly. I pray that we will pray more consistently with a laser focus on the condition of our hearts. In our series, What Would Jesus Undo in Our Lives? Am I the only one that is constantly learning something through these series? I'm always learning something new about myself. The Holy Spirit has not failed yet through these messages. It appears like I'm always learning a lesson. When will these lessons and these teachings end? I ask myself. It gets frustrated sometimes. It's like, man, I got that wrong too. Ah. The day will come home, will come when I get to go home and be with Jesus. Amen? So I look forward to that one day. The story that we're going to be moving through tonight in context is actually about the kingdom of God. Jesus is teaching using parables. Parables are stories or illustrations that are alongside the truth that he's trying to get into the hearer's ears and their hearts to show those who will listen what he has come to establish through his ministry. I believe that this story contains the very essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Starting with chapter 16 and through chapter 19, the overall big idea, again, is the kingdom of God. Got Questions, the website that I frequently uh, hang out at and learn from that site, broadly speaking, they say, the kingdom of God is the rule of an internal, sovereign God over all the universe. And then they say, more narrowly, the kingdom of God is a spiritual rule over the hearts and the lives of those who will willingly submit to God's authority. Those who defy God's authority and refuse to submit to him are not part of God's kingdom. In contrast, those who acknowledge the lordship of Christ and gladly surrender to God's rule in their hearts are a part of the kingdom of God. In this sense, the kingdom of God is spiritual. Jesus said his kingdom was not of this world, John 18, 36. As he preached that repentance is necessary to be a part of the kingdom of God, Matthew 4, 17, that the kingdom of God can be equated with the sphere of salvation which is evident, John 3, 5 through 7, where Jesus says the kingdom of God must be entered by being born again. If it's a spiritual kingdom, how can we get in? How can We can't feel, we can't touch. How can we get into that kingdom? You need to be birthed into that kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom, and there's a spiritual birth that takes place. I'm going to unpack that later. I believe that there's three kingdom of gods that the Bible teaches us about, and I want to make sure that we differentiate which one they're talking about. In Luke chapter 17, it says in verse 20, now, we, now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. You can't see it. Nor will they say, Here it is, or see it there. For indeed, indeed the kingdom of God is within you, or in the midst. The law 
and the prophets such as Isaiah all pointed to this right now time that we're talking about and we're going to unpack in the book of Luke, that first century while Jesus was still here on earth. Jesus the Messiah and his ministry included teachings, healings, the work on the cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection, all a part of the plan of the spiritual kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has always been, but now you can experience it. You cannot touch it per se, but you can experience daily the effects of the kingdom of God. Then one day we can rest for eternity in the kingdom of God. So we see that there's a spiritual kingdom. And this was the first century Jews and the Greeks, the pagans, all of them were watching Jesus Christ explain the truths of why he was there and what he was about to do and what would come next. The next kingdom for another teaching series <laughs> all the way uh, is called the earthly kingdom. This is where Christ himself will govern the world and those who have placed their faith in Jesus, who've been born again into the kingdom of God, will rule and reign with him. Will rule and reign in this earthly kingdom for a thousand years, which is called the millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom is the title given to the 1,000 years ruling and reigning with Jesus here on earth, which is prophesied in Zechariah 14 and Revelation chapter 20, just to name a few. So we got the spiritual kingdom, we got the earthly kingdom, and then we have the eternal kingdom. This is our third kingdom. After we've finished ruling and reigning with Jesus, we'll be ushered into the new heavens and the new earth. 2 Peter 3, our psalm that we read in verse 13, you guys actually said it out loud. Revelation chapter 21, all talk about eternity. We're going to be with Jesus. Those who have been born into the spiritual kingdom of God will rule and reign with him on an earthly kingdom and then eventually rest with him with whatever it's going to look like in eternity. All right, so there's where we're coming from, and this is what he's getting pushed back because these people want the earthly kingdom right now, these Pharisees. The parables on prayer in chapter 18 reveal to us that God hears our prayer and will answer them. In verse 18, 1 through 8, there's a whole series of the persistent widow, it's called. Uh, I'm not going to get into that because of time, uh, but it's all about we can be confident that he hears the prayers and he's working things out because his master plan through the ages is being worked out and we are a part of this plan. If you have breath in your lungs, you are a part of this plan. Now, whether you choose to go and work with Jesus in this plan, that's on you. You and him got to work that out. But we must be patient, consistent, and found faithful according to uh, Luke 18, 1 through 8. We need to be faithful in our prayer and consistent. And then without influence, without bribe money, these judges that this lady was talking to in this first verses, 1 through 8, it was just awful. He wasn't going to listen to her. But it's a picture of her persistence that she, he finally said, okay, enough of this, I'm going to grant your prayer. So her prayer was answered, and it's a picture for us as we are reading in the Gospels of how Christ wants us to pray. We pray with persistence. We don't stop just because we don't hear an answer right away because he's working things out. Let's say that uh, illustration, let's say that I'm, I asked you to give me $5. Well, it's going to take you a minute to get the $5. I've got to be patient and wait for the $5 because you're doing your part. I don't know that you're doing your part, but God told me to ask you for $5. He's working on it because you heard it in prayer. I need to give Randy $5, but I've got to go work first. I go work, I get some money, I pay my bills, and i got $5 left over, and I'm going to give it to you. That might have been a whole series of uh, two or three weeks maybe. I don't know. But you see how the example that I gave you right off the top of my head, that wasn't even in my notes, that was for free. Um, <clears throat> but that's a picture of how I see it about God's working in other people in order to get our prayers answered. Sometimes he heals right away. Like I had a kidney stone on Saturday at 2 in the morning. By Sunday, 2 in the morning, I went from a pain of about an 8, had the guys pray for me on Saturday morning Bible study. By the end of the night, Sunday morning around the same time, I was probably down to about a three, and on Monday, I had it was all completely gone. Sometimes God does that, and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes you've got to go through the whole process of a kidney stone, and it is, whew, awful. Been there, done that. So, the second parable 
the one that we're going to dig into is Luke 18, 9 through 14. It reveals to us our true heart attitudes we must have when we commit to prayer with the Creator. There are two characters in this story that we're about to read, both very different men. Pharisees were a religious sect whose focus was on keeping the law of Moses. Remember that in the back of your mind. These guys are all about keeping the, the rules and regulations. And then we have the tax collector who were considered traitors and thieves. Why, you ask? Because they collected taxes for Romans, for the Romans and from their fellow Jews with a generous take of their own. Give me the tax. The Jews says you're supposed to, or the Romans say you're supposed to pay this. You're a Jew. You're going to pay this amount. Well, he says it's also this amount. He takes off the top. And then he gives his stuff. So these guys were feeling ripped off by these guys, overcharging like crazy. Sound familiar? <laughs> In our current culture? <laughs> That's right. That's what I meant. It seems like familiar. We're being taxed like crazy. I'm going to read the entire story. It's just six verses of this story out loud uh, while it's on the screen. Just let the words kind of wash over you, and then I'm going to unpack what he's talking about so that we can walk away here understanding a little bit what God is actually asking of us to do. So this is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. It's on the screen, verse 9. Awesome. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. The two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterer, or even as a tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. 13, and the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Wow, what a lesson. There's a couple things I want to pull out of this lesson for us. In verse 9, he spoke of this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. The Pharisees' prayer appeared to be self-centered, maybe even on the grounds of their own righteousness. This is the creator of the universe and Lord of all. Do we really have the right to approach him on our terms? Paul the Apostle said that our righteousness is like filthy rags in the Lord's sight. This Pharisee, he even despised others. So what does that mean, to despise others? This Pharisee was so focused on himself that he made no effort to acknowledge the tax collector at all. That's what that meant. He's not even paying attention to you because he's so paying attention to himself. And if you remember last week, for those that were here, Pastor Pat talked about hypocrisy. And that's where your words are speaking, but your heart is completely different. And he held up this sign of a hypocrite wearing a mask. This is not really you. So let me read this with, in character. I'm going to get in character. I'm going to read the Pharisee's prayer. The Pharisee stood, and he prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, even adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes to all that I possess. Sounds real super spiritual, doesn't it? Hypocrite. You would think that's the moral of the story, but there's more to it. People of God should never, ever look at the people this way. He was looking at this guy with such a hatred and a despise that he was comparing himself. In verse 10, it says, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. In our short story for today, we see that the call to pray was for all men, okay? They were all called to go up to the temple and pray. For some reason, Luke pulled this story out, being inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this down, and he took notes, and this is what he's writing to, and we're unpacking it today in 2019. This was at the temple. This is what I would call public prayer. Temple culture has its sacred areas where only priests were to go, but Gentiles and Jews would come to the temple to interact for shopping and for template rituals. Everyone realized this temple was one of the most sacred places on earth. 
the one place where heaven and earth seem to meet. Verse 11, he carries on. And the Pharisee stood and he prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men or the extortioners or the adulterers or even like this tax collector. What does Luke really mean when he says the Pharisee prayed thus within himself? It is as if he's lifting himself up on how good he is. It appears this man is so caught up in keeping of rules that he prays in a way that glorifies himself. You see the heart behind what Jesus is saying through Luke? This guy's trying to glorify himself. Look at me, publicly, mind you. Look at me. He's up in the courts in front of a lot of people. Look at me, how righteous I am. This is a picture that glorifies the outward focus with no regard to what's coming from the inside, his heart condition. When we focus on rule keeping, we will look down on those who are not keeping those same rules. You ever do that? It's like you learn a new truth about the scriptures and you want to go out and practice. You tell somebody about it, you go, oh, you're not doing that? I am. I'm doing it just fine. Right? We all go through that because we have that sin nature bent. We just want a bent, a natural drift towards sin. But you have to fight that and change that. And that's what happens when you're feeding yourselves the truths that change you on the inside. This guy, he is keeping the rules and doing pretty good at it, according to his things, his uh, commentary right there. This type of prayer is lacking faith in God. It's lacking humility and the repentant heart that Jesus is looking for. I didn't see any sign of that in this Pharisee. That leads me to truth number one. For those that are taking notes, this is truth number one. When we are full of ourselves, there is no room for God. When we are full of ourselves, there's no room for God. Verse 13. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast, saying to God, Be merciful to me, a sinner. Here comes my favorite part. The actions here in verse 13 are complete opposite of that of the Pharisee. In public, this Pharisee, the Pharisee is lifting up the whole self to the heavens, if you will. This tax collector can't even lift his eyes up to the heavens. Feels disqualified, unworthy even to enter the temple, with what was on his heart to confess. It appears to me in the text that the tax collector is relying on the mercy and compassion of God. How many of you guys have been in that spot? Yeah, it should be all of us, I would think. I think all of us, if we look in the mirror just for a moment, would realize, man, I stinketh. That's King James. For not so good smelling. I can imagine... Here, listening to the elegant words flowing in this polished speaker's voice from the Pharisee, like I kind of went over, those nice, polished, rehearsed. But then imagine what the humble tax collector's voice was sounding like. Beating on his chest, mumbling in a sense, tears perhaps. In one commentary I read, this beating on his chest was like a continual self-beating, a self-punishing beating on the chest, indicating a godly sorrow. Oh, how I have sinned. This leads me to our next truth. There's only two points in here. Our position that is justified by Jesus. Truth number two says this, for those, again, taking notes. When we are empty, when we empty ourselves, excuse me, we are in the perfect position to be filled with God's grace. Amen? Amen. I want to share with you what I believe the parable, why this parable is about the gospel. I, I talked to you earlier about it. In verse 14, I tell you this, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbled himself will be exalted. Remember when I read that? In verses 9 through 14, the Pharisee prays simply to congratulate himself on being better than others and to rehearse his good deeds. It is the tax collector, the one who finds nothing in himself to be proud of, whom God hears. The ancient Greek word translated here, be merciful, be merciful, is 
hilaskomi, hilaskomai, hilaskomai. It's a Greek word. It actually, the word for atoning sacrifice. Now, if you were to read fast past here and not do your homework and kind of slow down and ask, what, why is he asking to be merciful? And you took the time to look up those words, you would find that there's a deep meaning here that I want to share with you guys. It is actually the word for atoning sacrifice. It can be truly stated by the tax collector this way. I'm going to say it again. God, be merciful to me through your atoning sacrifice for sins because I am a sinner. Boy, doesn't that read deep that way when you read it in the original language? It is used one other place in Scripture, and that's Hebrews 2.17 for those taking notes. It is translated propitiation. Have you heard of that word? Propitiation. If only would we, we would pray with less words and more true meaning. We see in this story, God, mercy, sins, the propitiation and the forgiveness of justification. For those, again, taking notes, propitiation is this, Jesus in my place. He took the place. He atoned for my sins. This sinner recognized that there's no way that any of the things that were counted good in his eyes were anything compared to what Jesus and the standard that he was preaching was at. Was at. Those that carried the law, the Pharisees, they understood God's very chosen people so miss it they become rule followers and so good at following rules that if you didn't look exactly like them, you weren't part of the crowd. They actually called you dogs as a Gentile. What? How is that representing their creator that loved them? That's why Jesus came at just the right time to tell the truth about who the Messiah really is. Propitiation. Jesus in my place. And then the word justification. This guy left justified, Jesus said, the, the tax collector, just as if I never sinned. Justified. So when you stand in the courtroom and the prosecutor's trying to lay all this on you, he paid my price. Jesus Christ paid my penalty. I am set free. Amen? Amen. amen. Yeah, amen. This is the good news. This is the good news that can only be received by faith in the one who paid the penalty of all our sins. Now listen to this. This is a story I heard while I was doing some research this last week. This is a story of a young girl who was taken advantage of by men, brutally raped by multiple men. She was clearing, clearly being wronged, and she deserved justice. Those men deserve justice because it is illegal to do what, they, what these men did. Not only is it illegal, it's unethical, it's immoral, it's, it's horrible, it's toxic. They clearly broke the law. But as the judge gave the verdict, he found these men not guilty due to a problem with the case and how it was handled. So they set this, these guys free. And the woman was just horrified. Just horrified. I know it sickens me too when crooks get off scot-free. Back to the story though. The girl later in life became a Christ follower. She became born again. She looked at the cross that day and knew her sins were against a holy and a righteous God, and she deserved death. She acknowledged her sin, asked forgiveness from God, and placed her faith with her whole heart in Jesus that he died and was buried, and he rose from the dead, just as the scriptures had written about. She became born again that day, and she testified of the rape that she endured. She told those who baptized her that those men will get justice one day. If they don't meet Jesus the way she had just met him, they will meet him another way, through judgment. What was awesome to hear from her story, and I picked up from this, you guys, and this is what I want you to share, or, or share with me and listen to this, is what she picked up. It's a deep understanding of grace. Justice was received on the very bloody body of Jesus Christ. The penalty for those men's sins and all of our sins was placed on Jesus Christ, our Lord. She has set free those men and is trusting in Christ to hear her all in all now. She, Christ is her all in all now. She has been set free. She let it go because she realized that the penalty that they were supposed to get paid, but they were set free because of a, a lapse in the courtroom uh, way that they did their business. She knows that Jesus took that. What they deserved, they took it. 
He took their sin. You follow what I'm saying? That sin, the justice, was placed on Jesus Christ. And that was enough for her. She believed it. She didn't hold a grudge. She let it go. Some people will live 30, 40 years with a grudge and won't let it go. But she understood what grace meant and let him take that burden from her. Did she ever forget? No, because she told the story, and it just about makes you cry when you're listening to it. Driving down the road, you're doing this number. Listening to a podcast where I heard this. I said, man, that is awesome. I got to share that so that we understand the grace. When we've been wronged, you guys, the person that did you wrong, their penalty was placed on Jesus Christ, and he took it. Wow. Right? Wow. What will Jesus undo? If he was going to undo something for us tonight, I believe our faith in our own righteousness. When we pray, we start thinking that we're doing these things, we're doing pretty good. I think he wants to take that away, and I think he wants us to act more like that tax collector and beat our breasts in such a way that we are serious and we're on our knees, we're on our face, we're doing whatever we need to do to confess that sin, to turn from that sin towards Jesus Christ for the healing like this story of this girl did. She gave it over. That's an important story that we need to remember. Now, today is the day of salvation. Why would anybody put off the most indis- important decision they could ever make in their lives concerning eternal life. The question that is often asked, you guys, if you were to die today, do you know for certain that you're going to go and be with Jesus in heaven? Without a shadow of a doubt, I know I'm going to be with Jesus. Can you say that? Have you ever heard of the ABCs of Salvation? It's a nice little thing for you guys to remember. I take this from another ministry. The A means admit you're a sinner. This is where the godly sorrow leads to a genuine repentance for sinning against a righteous God. Admit you're a sinner. And then there's a change of heart when we do that. We change our mind and God changes our hearts and he regenerates us from the inside out. That's what a a newborn believer, that's the first step. He understands that I can't do anything on my inside. I'm going to allow Jesus Christ to take care of that part. I'm just going to show up and do what he told me to do. I'm going to admit that I fail daily in my sin. Romans 3.10, as it's written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all born sinners, which is why we must be born spiritually in to enter the kingdom of heaven. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, the bad news is that the wages of sin is death. In other words, our sin means that we have been given a death sentence. We have the death penalty hanging over our heads. That's the bad news. But here's the good news. The good news is that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It is by grace that we've been saved through faith. And this Faith is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can take or no one can boast. Because we like to boast. We like to be bent towards pride. And we want to say, look what I did. You can't do this. That faith was given by God. So believe. A, admit you're a sinner. B, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins. Believe he was buried and that God raised Jesus from the dead. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus died and was buried and rose again, just as the scriptures have said. This is trusting with all your heart that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And then C, A, B, C's. A, admit you're a sinner. B, believe that you are, um, th- that Jesus died on a cross, was resurrected. C, call upon the name of the Lord. Isn't that easy to remember? Every single person who ever lived since Adam will bend their knee and confess at their mouth that Jesus is Lord in one, p- one part or another. Better to do it today than at the day when you never gave it a chance.
but you will say Jesus is Lord. As much as you're fighting, even those online, as much as you're fighting and saying, no, I don't want to give my heart over because it's going to cost me. You're going to send me to some weird country where they don't have french fries or something weird like that. You make up all kinds of reasons why you don't want to follow Jesus. I'm telling you right now, don't believe the lies. The truth is that you admit you're a sinner. You believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sin. He was buried and that God raised him from the dead. Simply call on the name of the Lord right now. Every single person, call on the name of the Lord if you have not done it yet. For it is written in Romans 14, it says, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue will confess that God uh, shall confess to God. Don't wait until later. Do it now. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what I got from this little six verses about the Pharisee and the tax collector. And man, it was a wrestling match to pull some of that truth out of there, to go deeper. But the one that got me was, be merciful to me. Lord, I'm a sinner and atoning blood, I need that to save me because you provided that. Amen? Oh God, thank you for your truth. We're going to trust you that the word goes into where the Holy Spirit already prepared a heart to receive these truths. We prayed before service that that would take place. We're asking faith that you will, asking by faith that you will save some. I know not everybody's there right now, Lord, but we pray for them right now. We pray for our families, our relatives that have not made the commitment. And for those that might even be in this room, that they would make a commitment right now and just say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. I want to turn from my sin. I believe Jesus Christ is, our son, is this, your son, and I believe he died on the cross for me, for my sin. I believe he was buried, and you raised him to life. Simple truth. And I have decided today, Lord, I pray someone has decided today to place their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Trusting only in his shed blood, not in their good deeds, but just trusting in, their, in the shed blood as sufficient to save his soul and take him to heaven. Thank you, Lord, for saving us and for saving those who just prayed that prayer or who are going to pray that prayer via online technology. Thank you for my friends here, God. Bless us. We did our best to worship you in song, in word, and in teaching. We love you, Lord, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For those who wish to give, there's a joy box in the back. Feel free to give generously and often. Go in peace. Amen.